The Season 2 World Championship was one of the most bittersweet events League of Legends fans have ever experienced. On the one hand, possibly the greatest upset in League history occurred in the form of the Taipei Assassins beating the heavily favorited Korean team Azubu Frost in Grand Finals three games to one, but as great as this upset was, there was something really sad about this event as a whole, namely, Season 2 Worlds was incredibly small. We only saw 12 teams attending from six total regions. Of these teams, the top four were given a direct seed into a playoff bracket, while the other eight were placed into a group stage. Here in groups, these teams would then play a single round robin, only three games each, to decide who advances to the bracket and who's sent home. The qualified teams from groups would then battle the previously seeded teams in a single elimination bracket to determine who's world champion. This is a really short event that doesn't really have many games being played, which is kind of disappointing for one major reason, namely, Season 2 Worlds was the last big international competition before the LCS era of League began. From Season 3 onward, the majority of all League events would just be local leagues that competed within each region. Little to no international competition occurred except for a World Championship at the end of every year, which this lack of international play got so frustrating for fans, they eventually complained enough that Riot created a new event halfway through each season called the Mid-Season Invitational. This future that lay ahead meant there was a really sad undertone that permeated throughout Season 2 Worlds. The thought that we wouldn't be seeing an event of this scale for another full calendar year, and that all we got to see of some of our favorite teams were maybe just three games before they were sent home, that was really depressing. Thankfully, the Season 2 World Championship wasn't actually the last international event to occur in 2012. There was one final competition that followed. It was another chance to compete for those who failed at Season 2 Worlds, an opportunity to cement legacies for those who succeeded, and the international debut of many up-and-coming rookies whose careers were just getting started. Today, we're talking about what many consider to be the best tournament LOL ever had, IPL5. IPL Series, or IGN Pro League, was a circuit of tournaments run by the gaming magazine IGN from 2011 to 2012. It was only halted after IGN was acquired by a larger conglomerate who allegedly cut the circuit as rumor had it these tournaments were not all that close to being profitable events. The content IPL provided us while it was still around, though, was some of the best when it came to production quality, tournament structures, and entertainment with its international events. For the League of Legends, side of things, though, no event was bigger or better than IPL5. Hosted in the city of Las Vegas, IPL5 saw 16 teams competing from even more regions than Season 2 Worlds. Not only did NA, EU, China, and Korea all have attendees, but Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Singapore would all be sending representatives as well. What was particularly impressive about the size and scope of this event was while IPL5 had more teams in attendance than Season 2 Worlds, it actually had less than half the runtime, only four days to squeeze in all of its matches and decide a winner. This short time frame pigeonholed the event's director, Nick Allen, into using a pretty creative and neat tournament structure that went as follows. Things would start off with a group stage that had four groups of four teams each. Groups would begin with teams playing a single best of one match against a fellow team in their group, where once that was done, the winners of that first round would play a best of one against each other, as would the losers. This would leave you with one team who was 2-0 and and one who was 0-2 who would finish at the top and bottom of their group respectively. The teams with 1-1 one one records would then play a final tiebreaker to decide who finished in the top half of their group and who finished in the bottom half. Here's the kicker though, all those teams who finished in the top half of their groups would be seeded into a bracket stage as they would at any normal 
normal event, but all the teams who finished in the bottom half would be seeded into a loser's bracket directly underneath them. The bracket stage would then go on as a normal double elimination bracket with teams playing best of threes until the grand finals, which was a best of five, with the team coming from winners having a one game advantage. This whole setup was absolutely brilliant. Group stage was exciting, with tons of importance placed on each individual game since there were only two or three games being played by each team in every group. The whole reason Season 2 Worlds didn't have many matches being played was because the event had this philosophy of limit the number of games so exciting upsets are more likely. Well, that's still going to be in place here. I mean, in this group stage, we're having best of ones and there is nothing more volatile than a best of one. But even with this volatility, an upset didn't end a team's event and send them home packing as most events would. Instead, they got a second chance to prove themselves in a loser's bracket, meaning we were always guaranteed to get tons of inter-regional competition from virtually every team here. Everything was set up to give us a great event with tons of clashing storylines and excitement. Now all that was left was for teams to play their matches, and oh boy, those matches did not disappoint on the entertainment factor. If we were to sit here and discuss every single storyline that occurred, this would probably turn into a 10 hour video, so instead, I'm going to just highlight the four biggest narratives that fans got to see throughout those four days, starting off with the oldest rivalry in LOL. The top two North American teams in attendance were the oldest organizations in the history of professional league, Team Solo Mid and Counter Logic Gaming. CLG had a pretty rocky run up to this event which started all the way back early on in Season 2. Throughout 2012, the org had been making every sacrifice they could to try and build the best team possible, hoping to do well at the Season 2 World Championship. Most notably, CLG went so far as to leave North America altogether and travel to Korea to play in the local Korean league twice. This was a big risk as it killed off a lot of their fan base who were no longer able to watch the team stream, produce content, or even see many of their games live, but they wanted to do everything they could to develop as players and put on a good performance at Season 2 Worlds. Unfortunately, things would not pan out the way they hoped. The team was seeded into the tougher of the two groups alongside tournament favorites Invictus Gaming and Azubu Frost and were only given three matches to play in their single round robin before either advancing or being eliminated. To make things more difficult, the team had also developed a few sneaky strategies that they thought could give them an edge, most notably a team-wide proxy and invade strategy which was most effective on blue side. But sadly for CLG, they would be randomly drawn to red side for all three of their games. They put up a good fight in every match but ended up going one and two in their group and of course, that meant they were eliminated from the event fairly fast. This was a sad result, both for the fans of CLG and curious onlookers. Whether you rooted for them personally or not, people were interested in seeing their creative strategies as well as just how good some of their players were. From their older legendary veterans like Hotshot GG, Big Fat GG, and Shouster, to their relatively new up-and-coming AD carry superstar in Doublelift, people wanted to see more of how this team would perform forum against international competition, but with this world's format, we didn't get to see anything else, making the Season 2 Championship a very sad affair for CLG. Luckily, we would get to see more of them a month later in Vegas at IPL5. Heading into the event, CLG made some pretty weird and drastic changes to their roster as they were in a transitional period with their team. Namely, they role swapped their jungler Hotshot GG back to his native top lane, Chouster, their support then went into the jungle, and the team brought in a new experimental Korean player in Loco Doco to duo with Doublelift bot lane. This squad had only played in a few small events together, and some of their rust as a team showed in group stage at IPL as they dropped a match against their sister team CLG EU, who'd make it out in first place. But when faced with their winner take all tiebreaker against Team Fear, they'd perform up to their usual standard as Doublelift shined brightly, beating his future lane partner Afromu in a pretty clinical display. 
In the bracket stage that followed, CLG would play a total of nine games, starting off by winning a series two games to one against Curse EU, where in a super tight and decisive game three, Doublelift would snag a pentakill in the final team fight to win CLG the game. And there is the Liverpool just to keep the rest of, of a Curse away. Bereshen go down and show the frontline tanks are now gone. Sona ult only getting vain is exhausted, but still doing damage extinct. Waiting for the reset, big bat, very low, but Toy King helping with a Brinton outrun one shot, taking down Oriana, helping a little bit from the turret, and double lift somehow makes got the to land. This advanced them to the winner's semifinals against Fnatic, where in game one, CLG destroyed the legendary EU squad with Doublelift getting another Penta. He's going down, double kill, triple kill, Soaz going to go down, there's the quadra kill. The only one left is Reckless, but the DFL isn't gonna get the stun to get him in range. Big Bat a little bit too low. Reckless underneath the turret, can Doublelift get it underneath the fountain? He gets the Penta kill. CLG would end up getting reverse swept by Fnatic to be knocked into losers, where they would then have to go up against one of the best teams in the world, Moscow 5. In spite of the tough competition, they would play phenomenally well, destroying M5 in game one, with once again Doublelift picking up his third pentakill. And then Doublelift picks up the kill. They turn back in a massive grasping route, twisting in advance, straight on towards Ghost of Pepper and Darien. Genja off of the side, just about respawn, but taken straight down. It's a triple, it's a quadra. Can he go for the penta on the for it? They're going for the penta on the fountain, but no, the shutdown comes out. One more shot, will it be enough? Instead, they oh, the true shot for misses. He found he does. Too late. He gets the penta, but he was too late, and it just turns into an ace. They did everything they could to get that penta, and they're just saying, hard shot. Finish the game. CLG would drop the next two games in the series, getting eliminated with a tied fifth place finish, which must have been disappointing for the squad, but this was a monumental success for the team and their fans. They came into this event with a really strange roster, but managed to go toe to toe with some of the best competition out there, beating a few of the best teams in the world in very impressive fashion. Even with them finishing outside top three, CLG fans, for the most part, were overall happy with this result, if for no other reason and then they got to see their favorite team play. This wasn't a short event like Worlds. We got to see all the highs and lows of this squad as they played a total of 12 matches over the course of these four days. The glimpses of just how great their older veteran players were still shone through, in addition to some of the great talent that their young prodigy AD Carey had that he was about to unleash on the world. To see them play so many competitive matches against so many great teams was just a joy regardless of the result. That's what was so great about IPL 5. There weren't many questions fans were left wondering when it came to the talent that each team had. We got to see enough games to judge all squads and see their best and worst moments. And while CLG was one of the more upbeat stories at this event, TSM was one of the more downbeat ones. TSM's 2012 went in a fairly different direction from other NA teams. Rather than spending time preparing for Worlds internationally in Korea, as many other Western orgs were doing, TSM chose instead to stay behind and try to win local NA tournaments, a task a bit easier since their toughest competition wasn't there. One of the biggest reasons they decided to do this was they recently signed a year-long lease on a gaming house in New York, which they were using as both a hub for practice and content content throughout the season. To their credit, they did manage to dominate the local competition leading up to the Season 2 Regional Finals where they got the number one overall seed from North America heading into Worlds, but after being given a bye through group stages and getting seeded against Azubu Frost in the first round of bracket, they would be eliminated after playing only two matches the whole event. Couple this with the fact that there were cheating allegations against Frost, who had one of their players turn around during the match to see the minimap at level 1, allowing Frost to dodge a TSM invade, and there was a big question mark on how good this team really was. TSM could easily be the best team in North America still, only losing early in Worlds because they were matched up against the tournament favorites in the first round, who also got an unfair advantage in Game 1 
or they could also just be overrated, only good at dominating North America domestically and unable to hold a candle to international competition? Well, thank goodness for IPL5, because again, this tournament gave us more games, which led to clarity in answering those questions. TSM's tournament started off similarly to CLG's with a 2-1 record to make it out of groups in the winner's bracket portion of the event. This included a near-perfect game in their tiebreaker against the Singapore Sentinels that showed just how good TSM could play when everything went right for them. As he takes on Urgot, chose to turn on the Chali, but he's taking some tower hits and decides to back up. Hits minions once or twice, leeches his life back, goes back in. There's a triple kill being acquired for Chaos. Can he get the quadra before Soraka goes into the fountain? No, he cannot. He does not want to dive in there with Jax as well. That would almost certainly be death for him. Instead, he's just going to win the game. TSM going out in style 12 0 against Singapore Sentinels, showing them how it's done and getting into that winner bracket matchup. Once in the bracket stage though, things would begin to get a bit more difficult. TSM started off in winners by getting swept two games to zero against CLG EU, which of course knocked them down into losers, where they would then be matched up against the Korean squad Azubu Blaze. They'd put up a good fight against Blaze in the first game, which they kept close for a little while, but eventually they would lose that first game along with the follow-up, eliminating them from the event this resulted in TSM ending up with just a tied 9th, 12th place finish. This was obviously disappointing for TSM fans who I'm sure wanted a better showing out of their team, but ultimately it might have been a blessing in disguise. Whereas Season 2 Worlds could have been written off as a bit of bad luck, IPL5 showed TSM that they did have issues with their roster only being able to dominate locally and struggling on the international stage. That might not be a fun fact to face, but you can't fix a problem if you don't don't know that problem exists, and without this event, TSM might have not learned about this issue for a while. The LCS model of having virtually no international events beyond Worlds must hamper teams who get used to doing so well in local leagues. I mean, if a team crushes a region for a while and only has one bad experience in a short international tournament at the end of the year, they theoretically could just write that off as a bit of bad luck and not feel any urgency to improve. I mean, if they're winning their own region all already, they must be good, right? Having IPL5 showed TSM that they did indeed have an issue that needed to be fixed, which they began to address pretty shortly afterward. Early on in 2013, the team would pick up a young wild turtle who took over for Chaos at AD Carry and was a pretty big success but not nearly the level of success that their roster move at the end of the year had where Reginald would step down with the team signing Bjergsen. Thankfully, it seems as though this event was the nice kick in the pants TSM needed to help the team improve so that from here on out, they would never get embarrassed on the international stage ever again. One of the biggest discussions that happens at the end of every competitive season of League is should the World Championship format be changed? For the most part, we've stuck to that World's format from Season 2, where we just have a group stage that feeds into a single elimination bracket afterward. The reason we've kept this format for so long is likely because it's given us some great upsets over the years, as a single elimination bracket is meant to do. One of the biggest arguments against double elimination brackets is they take away the possibility of those exciting upsets. I mean, in single elim, theoretically anyone can play better than normal in a series to take out a tournament favorite, but if you give that big favorite a safety net like a second bracket to play through, they can almost always still make it to grand finals off of their talent carrying them throughout the tournament alone. Well, IPL5 showed us that's not always the case. In retrospect, the favorites to win IPL5 heading into the event were almost certainly the Korean squad Azubu Blaze. This was a Korean team who beat virtually all the other top Korean squads in the qualifiers to make it here and had a star-studded roster that included Flame, Helios, Ambition, Captain Jack, and Lustboy. These were some of the best individual talents in Korea's scene during Season 2 and are still today regarded as legendary veterans 
veterans, some of which are still playing professionally or working as a coach. This was also at the start of the era of Korean dominance, where for the next five years, Korea would be winning every single world championship repeatedly with no real competition from anywhere else. No other regions came close to a title. For a long time, we just saw Korean teams stomping through worlds with ease until they faced other Korean teams. Blaze themselves had already participated in this dominance before as they had taken first place at an MLG summer arena and MLG 2012 fall championship while not dropping any matches except to another KR team named Najin Sword. In this half decade, it seemed as though Koreans were the only ones who could beat Koreans in League of Legends, so for Blaze to be the only Korean squad at IPL5, they would have to be favorites to win it all. Blaze was seeded into Group A at the start of this event, which proved to be one of the tougher of the groups. They'd have to face off against both Fnatic from Europe, Team WE from China, and an amateur North American squad named Team Dynamic that consisted of future pros Zion Spartan, Nintendo Dex, Don't Mash Me, and the number one ranked League of Legends player from the game's beta, Takashi X. Blaze's first match was against that Dynamic roster, who put up a pretty good fight for being an amateur squad, keeping the match close for a while. Eventually, though, Blaze got into their traditional Korean form and were able to close out the match with relative ease and finished with an impressive gold lead. They were looking strong and had plenty of momentum headed into their next game against Team WE. But then, something unexpected happened. All the skills, but there we go. Kameh's actually going in as well. There's the absolute zero being popped from Nunu. Double kill being picked up by Diana. She jumped in as soon as Rengar did. They ain't gonna on the back of this, gonna take up a kill from Kogma. Meanwhile, Rengar's gonna melt that ambitious rise and flame. The only one left, and he is snuffed out by Wei Zhao. That is a complete ace from World Elite. Five for none against the Zubu Blaze, and they, they surrender! surrender. Blaze forfeits, and World Elite can advance from the group 2-0. This was a pretty big shock to see China top Korea, considering the dominance we would see in the rival regions for years to come. This sent Blaze into a tie-breaking series against Fnatic, the other one-in-one -one team in their group. At the end of the day, Fnatic probably didn't stand much of a chance here. I mean, Blaze choking in a single best of one was one thing, but losing two games back to back, there was no way that could happen in a million years. Tries to toss around a bandage toss onto a side but the top lane, we've seen a very close engagement here. Records having to use his glen straight away, and taking down very low flash from captain jack finishes off the job can he another the passive the passive comes out and a great turnaround kill from records there the passive landed very well from n rated there well i believe in that whole exchange and honestly they only lost the jungler and that's going to be captain jack getting caught out there pk comes straight in diving across so as gets the kill absolutely dominating here Turret bouncing diving from pk Diving straight in, there's the rupture, catching the rest of the team. They are dropping like flies, double kill for records. Captain Jack forced to go back onto his Nexus Fountain, but it doesn't matter, it's all over, and Azubu plays are defeated by Fnatic here at IPL5. Fnatic didn't just beat Azubu Blaze, they dismantled them. Because of the tournament's format, of course, Blaze was not out of this event, although they would be seeded into the loser's bracket, falling behind Fnatic and WE, who would make it out of groups. Blaze would have a pretty tough route for making a comeback happen, since the loser's bracket did have a considerably harder path compared to winners, but for a dominant Korean squad of their level, it was certainly a possibility possibility. They started off getting some momentum early on with a 2-0 sweep of Thailand's Black Bean, followed by their 2-0 sweep of TSM. At this point, it was difficult to argue that they didn't have the talent and momentum to continue this streak, all the way to a deep run, potentially to Grand Finals. But then, Moscow 5 got in their way. Hanging around there by the red, he's got Nunu coming in as well. He does have the smite. Oh, he oh and he's got it. a smite. Helios now in trouble. Where's the cleaver at? There's the cleaver. First blood to Moscow 5. He's got to run back. They're going to move in. Helios taking a lot of damage early on. Alex roaming around. Who's going to fall first? A nice crescendo goes off. There we go. Alex just picks up one, picks down, and Ambition's going to fall as well. That's two for zero. Lost Boy caught an absolute zero. This is going to be three right here, and they are mopping up a Zubu Blitz. Captain Jack falls. That makes four, and only Flame gets away from that fight. What a fight. The Zubu can start a fight at the blink of an eye. Well, here we go. Shockwave coming in. Gossip Pepper going to get caught. He actually got the crescendo off before he went down. There's the Ezreal ultimate as well. What? <coughs> 
where the damage coming from as I die halfway through the fight. Genju going low, they're gonna force him in. It's the Lulu ultimate on flame that's causing so many problems. But there is a kill, the double kill in fact, coming out for Jax. Now Darian may have some trouble of his own. He actually flashes away, Counter-Strike gun is stunning him up. The entire team of Azuma Blaze is hammering away on him and he may have a load of health, but it's only a matter of time. And that will be a four for zero. What a fight for Azuma Blaze. And that's a perfect Azuma Pepper. This could be bad. Nocturne gonna go in there. That was a decent crescendo coming down. Actually, they're getting hit here by Alex Hitch. A good amount of damage from the back. What a play out of Alex Hitch. They didn't expect that one whatsoever. There's a Zonya's Hourglass pop by Ambition. But is he gonna go down before picking up anyone else? Yes, he will. Moscow 5 in the end. Don't lose a single man. They pick up three. And take down that inhibitor turret as well. That's all turrets down now outside of the base where the fight's gonna kick off. Flame going low. There's a Zyra ultimate. Ezreal ultimate comes across brilliantly as well. Ambition pops his Zonyas. He's got a Guardian Angel in there as well. Flame's Guardian Angel was popped. This should be two kills straight after one another. There we go. It's Ezreal and Sona that pick them up. Captain Jack is one of the last hopes. They're trying to get as much help up as they can before they go in to try and rescue the Nexus. The turrets are down though. And Moscow 5 are going to take out Azubu Blaze here in the IPL 5 lower bracket and move on to play CLG Prime. M5 took down the Koreans, eliminating them from IPL 5 in a two games to one set. This meant the Korean powerhouse would be eliminated with a tied 7th, 8th place, finishing lower than not just Goliaths like EU's M5, but even perceivably weaker teams like North America's CLG. This is what made IPL5 so fun. Its structure gave us some really crazy upsets like this, which were really exciting to see live, but they weren't just manufactured upsets through a bad tournament structure or something. I mean, these losses were all completely legitimate. Blaze were only eliminated after losing against three separate teams who all genuinely played better than them. This is one of the coolest kinds of upsets you can see in sports, one that's completely unexpected coming out of nowhere, but one that's entirely deserved. Now with Blaze eliminated, this tournament was wide open for anyone to win. There were tons of talented squads fighting to make top three from multiple different regions, but nobody had more to prove than our next story, the pride of Taiwan. TPA were the defending world champions from the LMS who earned their title in impressive fashion. On their championship run, although they got a buy out of groups, they would have to beat three of the undisputed best teams at season two worlds in best of threes and an eventual best of five. It's worth mentioning they won these games in crushing fashion too to earn their championship, leaving little to no doubt as to how much they deserved it. But even then, some people questioned how talented this team really was. They were clearly good, no doubt, but they never really played in any international event prior to Worlds. In those early days of League, where we had a new international tournament every month or two, League fans didn't automatically assume that a team who came first in one tournament was automatically the best in the world. I mean, you could definitely argue that maybe TPA had a good run, maybe it was just a favorable patch, maybe there was something to their success at Season 2 Worlds that they wouldn't be able to replicate if they ever had to compete internationally again. Well, when TPA got qualification to IPL5, they had an opportunity to put those arguments to rest. Things started off strongly for them in groups, as TPA was able to beat Thailand's Blackbean as well as Moscow 5 to make it out in first place. Blackbean was considered one of the weaker teams from Southeast Asia, but M5 was as dominant and impressive as it gets. I mean, they'd knock out Azubu Blaze, as we just mentioned, and M5 themselves were one of the favorites to win worlds that TPA had to upset to win their Season 2 championship. This was about as impressive of a start as TPA could have, but right when everything was going so well for them, they would falter in their first round of bracket, getting swept by Fnatic two games to zero. They're gonna turn it around. Trishop Barrage hitting the hole of Fnatic. Is it gonna be enough? Toys gets around of there. Ludo Ultimate comes down. and rating does go down. They do manage to get one, but is it enough? Toys getting dropped. Reckless in there. Reckless picks up a double kill. Manages to go for BB. BB gonna get dropped. That's a triple kill. Going towards Mistake. Can he be in a quadrant kill? No, no. he can't. So as gets it, it doesn't matter. It's an ace. Fnatic are pining through the middle. How they got enough to take down the top? 
I pay assassins here at the IPL 5. Yes, they do. The Nexus turrets are going to burn. Fnatic have 2 owed Taipei Assassins, unbelievable. What a result. If this was a single elimination event, that would be the end of their story as TPA would look pretty unimpressive. Losing in the first round of playoffs isn't really what you expect of this season two world champions, and I'm pretty sure plenty of people would be calling their title fraudulent if that happened. But thankfully, this was a double elimination tournament. TPA had a second chance to prove themselves, and boy, did they make the most of that. Honestly, when Darius came back in the lane, they were within six minutes of each other, both pretty low. Oh, the pull of a mistake first. That's going to do so much damage. Trying to pick it up. Silver Bolt's going to land. Oh, he flashes out of it, and the ref is going to get them so low. One goes down, LY4. Left alone, can he find mistake? Oh, he wants some. He finds. Oh, he, he misses the seed that would have been the kill with the Vine Lasher. Oh, he was right around the, the wall. He wasn't actually able to get it, but Bebe has the movement speed advantage. He gets the vision off the seed. There's the kill. They oh, yeah. grab this and uh, it next. Nexus and then end this. So that's going to be 2-0 for TPA over SGS in a really impressive series. And they move on through this loser's bracket. Can they, can they leave the safety of their towers at all? Well, not really because they're being pushed in. They have to be there to defend safe. Vicious actually using the fight and just kill Look at the angles on it. Oh, they're exhausted. Oh, 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 sniping him down. Holy crap. Enough Stanley trying to give Chase the Spiders blocking away, but does finally catch up. There are the flashes. Vayne trying to do the best you can, cop over on the side, but Bebe with the pinch. You shall not leave, you shall not pass. The Sheriff is in town. That is an ace. TPA, five for one. That is going to be game. There's the Hemo play coming out from Frog, and that was the initiation. They're cursing the side mummy on toys. They get him down, that could be good, but he's flashing forward. Lula Ultimate actually went down on their mistakes very low. Frog, though he's in trouble, pulls through the card. This Ultimate is gonna get a triple kill. Annihilates Blitzcrank, takes out a Mumu. Stanley goes into the brush, jumps on the yellow feet. He's gonna go down. Now Wicked running away for his life. BB gets the kill. It's gonna be a double kill. It's gonna be an ace. Taipei Assassins white CLGU off the board. And BB in this fight, and now they're going into this inhibitor. No one from CLG is up for 15 more seconds. It looks like they're marching onto their Nexus Towers. And it looks like Taipei Assassins, your season two winners, they are gonna win against CLGU. TPA would win their next four series, eight of their following nine games to make an incredible loser's bracket run, only finally being eliminated once they rematched Fnatic in the loser's finals. Even though they did get swept in this EU rematch, they secured a top three overall finish, which was about as impressive of a loser's bracket run as we had ever seen. On this route, TPA had to beat the Singapore Sentinels, Curse NA, CLG EU, and Moscow 5 again, all teams who ranged from being great regional powerhouses to world title contending favorites. Any of those prior arguments you can make about how, oh, TPA just got lucky against M5, or, oh, if they had to face off against CLG EU, then they'd get stomped. I mean, that could all be put to rest. In clinical form, the Taipei Assassins cemented their legacy as a top world-class team who was just as talented as any other squad on the world stage. This was a team who very shortly after this event would start disbanding their roster and eventually retired without much else to their name other than their world championship. And without IPL5, it could have easily been swept under the rug as a weaker world title similar to that of season one worlds. But thankfully to this event and its format, we got to see just how good this team really was and how impressive their talent could shine in its era. But at this point, I think we've talked enough about these lower bracket stories. Let's go ahead and talk about the teams who made it all the way. Europe and China have had a pretty interesting rivalry in League's modern competitive history, as both regions today play some of the most fast-paced and fun League there is to offer. They regularly find themselves facing off against each other in the later stages of recent world events, and although China has been getting the better of Europe as of late, this rivalry can actually be traced all the way back to Season 2 Worlds when EU first got the upper hand on China. At that Season 2 Championship, the number 1 and number 2 
two Chinese squads faced off against the perceived number one and number two European teams in the quarterfinals of the bracket. There, Moscow 5, the dominant Russian org, would sweep Invictus Gaming pretty easily two games to zero, but China's number one seed, Team WE, would have a somehow even more agonizing experience. If you're new to League of Legends, you may not know, this roster Team WE had was one of the best we've ever seen assembled in the history of the game. Chow Mei top lane, Clear Love in the Jungle, and FZZF at support were all fantastic players who were some of the best at their position, just world-class talents who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe against anyone and helped establish WE themselves as one of the best teams in China throughout seasons one and two. But the big stars of this team everyone remembers was their mid laner Messiah and their AD carry Wei Zhao. Messiah today is probably most remembered for being one of the best Twisted Fate players of all time, so much so that he never lost a competitive game with TF for the first two years of his career. The only player you could argue was maybe better than him on this roster was Wei Zhao, who would go down as one of the best AD carries in the history of League even today. The whole Chinese meta of Team Teams focusing their play around an incredible playmaking marksman traces its lineage back to him, one of the best to ever do it. After dominating China's local events throughout 2012, WE, with all their talent, were one of the overall favorites to win that Season 2 championship. Being China's number one seed, they were given a bye directly into the quarterfinals, where they'd have to face off against CLG EU in what turned out to be one of the weirdest best of threes League has ever had. It started off as a fairly normal series, with WE winning Game 1 in convincing fashion. They took that momentum into Game 2, establishing another early lead, giving themselves a great opportunity to just win here and advance to the next stage of bracket, but after about a dozen minutes of play or so, the internet crashed at the venue. This was a pretty interesting problem that Riot and the teams would have to solve. After a long discussion, they eventually agreed to remake the game, but with new picks and bans. At first, things continued as they had in the first game too, with Team WE getting a huge lead early on in the match, but CLG EU would eventually stall things out long enough that they would come back and tie the series one to one. This sent the teams into a winner-take-all tie-breaking game three. Throughout that third match, both teams played really passively as neither one of them wanted to make a mistake that would cost their squad a shot at winning worlds. After going through this whole ordeal of playing this extended best of three, this wasn't particularly fun for fans to watch though, and actually got so bad from a spectator's point of view that fans at the venue started just cheering for ward kills. You can see it. We know you can see it. In fact, they've got two oracles now. Wicked and Crepo. They do get the ward. People are cheering ward kills now. It's starting it's to stretch out that much. that happens, man. Because this game has been so much poking over and over. I think CLG is actually waiting for the next bear. And another ward kill. The crowd goes wild. And now they're in to hit the tower, getting a bit of damage down. After just under an hour of play, the match looked like it was finally coming to a head. CLG EU took a Baron and had what seemed like a slight edge on WE, so they started pushing down mid lane to try and end the game, and they began what would almost certainly be a decisive fight that would win the game for one of the two teams. But then the internet crashed again. Right when the series was about to close, we were back to square one. Oh, no!
This would be followed up by another remake, this time with the same picks and bans, but this would just turn into another unfinished game as the internet would crash for a third time 25 minutes in to this second game three. Upon trying to get the internet back online at the venue, players soon started having some PC difficulties and other issues that further delayed game three for so long that CLGEU and WE players were stuck on stage for nearly eight hours. After a very long while, the event staff finally decided that the series would just go unfinished for now. Instead, they would play a final game to decide a winner during the next stage of the event, during the day the semifinal games were also being played. This was obviously not the kind of international experience WE wanted to have, and would be made even more disappointing by a very close loss in that decisive Game 3. For all their accomplishments in China and all the prior international events they attended, this team, who was stacked with some of the best Season 2 players in the world, would get little to no recognition for it here at the World Championship, as they finished the tournament with only three matches played, or at least three matches completed, and a close 2-1 series loss. Naturally, when WE qualified for IPL 5, they went in hoping for a better experience, as this might be one of the last chances for this roster to prove themselves on the international stage. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, Europe was having its own interesting storylines develop throughout that 2012 season, the biggest of which was the emergence of Moscow 5 and CLGEU as two teams who were the best in the world at times. This cast a bit of a shadow on some of the other older European orgs who had been in the scene prior to them. One of those older organizations that people began sleeping on was none other than Fnatic, who were previously known as the best team in Europe. Fnatic were the team who were technically defending world champions as they had won the first small season one championship, but sadly would not be at season two worlds to defend their title as they lost the European qualifiers to CLG EU, M5, and SK Gaming. They had been on a bit of a downslide prior to this, but I'm sure missing out on worlds was the greatest disappointment they had seen up until that point. It seemed to be such a big frustration that in fact, the organization would make a really tough decision letting go their legendary AD carry veteran Lamia Zealot who helped them win that season one championship. Instead, the team seemed to look more towards the future as they signed a 16-year-old Wunderkind to replace him who went by the name Reckless. Although Reckless was still so young he legally wouldn't be allowed to compete in the upcoming EU LCS for a full year, Fnatic still took the risk of signing him in the hopes that the young prodigy could gain experience at a future tournaments like IPL and develop his talent for the organization in what they hoped would be a long and fruitful career. Surprisingly enough, Fnatic weren't even supposed to be at IPL 5 as they again came up short in the qualifiers for the event. Qualifying for IPL in Europe consisted of playing through four separate brackets where the champion in each would earn a spot at the event. Fnatic made it to the grand finals of two of those brackets, but would lose in the finals of both of them, missing out on a trip to Vegas. Luckily for them, one of the teams who qualified named Team Eloblade, later sponsored as Team Alternate, wasn't able to afford the trip to Vegas and had to drop out. This meant the runner-up of that qualifier would be given the right to a attend instead, which just so happened to be Fnatic. As we mentioned before, Fnatic and Team WE were seeded into the same group, Group A, where they both got those big upset victories against Azubu Blaze. This led to each of the two teams qualifying for the winner's bracket and suddenly had a great opportunity to make a deep run. Well, I've already spoiled how Fnatic's tournament went. They got their 2-0 sweep of TPA, followed by a 2-1 victory against CLG, which advanced them to the winner's finals with a guaranteed top three finish, which was a pretty impressive series of wins for a team who technically didn't even qualify for this event. They played incredibly well though, as Reckless was looking like a fantastic talent for someone so young, developing quickly on the world stage alongside Fnatic's older veterans like Xpeke. Maybe the only team who performed more impressively up until this point was Team WE on the other side of the bracket. WE had their own crazy path they'd have to take to advance, starting off by having to play against Moscow 5, who 
eliminated their Chinese rival at Season 2 Worlds. Well, for as impressive as everyone believed M5 to be, WE would destroy them pretty handedly in a 2-0 series sweep. This then put them in the winner's semifinals where they would get a rematch against CLG EU, the team who they lost to agonizingly at Worlds. Nobody remembered that series better than they did, as in Game 1, they demolished CLG with a gigantic snowball victory that wasn't all that close and must have felt like a nice piece of revenge for them, but this CLG team was still incredibly talented and put up a great fight in the following game. If there was one thing CLG EU was known for in their playstyle, it was an ability to drag out a match and scale into a crazy late game, so when they got a great scaling teamfight composition in Game 2, with Rumble top lane, Amumu jungle, Lee Sin mid, and a Kogma Zyra bot lane, they were in their comfort zone. After successfully making it through the first 20 to 30 minutes of the game with relative ease, it looked like they were going to be able to pick up a victory and force a game three. Every team fight started going CLG EU's way as they picked up more and more kills and gold, eventually transitioning their lead into objectives, getting as far as WE's Nexus turrets. WE's on the other hand, didn't really stand much of a chance against them anymore in a straight up team fight. The only way they'd be able to win now was if they could do something creative. Sneaking around with an Oracle so he knows if he gets seen by wards or not. Gonna try to clear off this inhibitor. This could be a base racer. CLG's gonna have to go back right away. Doing as much damage as they can here, World Elite. But that inhibitor is going to fall. Chalmay is up there as well. And he is, oh, that inhibitor spawned on him. That's not the ideal situation, but he's gonna take it out. And CLG starting to back away. I think they realize that they can't keep going with this one. See them portaling back. Frog and stop. WE to stop everyone from CLG. From he's backing. using his ulti. They have he's to get up. He's back they have to get up to stop CLG. Ultimate going in. Chalmay is on the tower. He is on the tower as they take down the other one on the other side there, CLG. They are backing. Let's get back over towards Chow Mei, as they are going to stop them from backing as long as possible. The oh, fight is stop. going to kick off. Rogan is in there. Let's have a look at the base. We need to see that. Sorry. Chow Mei is taking it low. He's going to get his GA popped here, actually, as Rumble comes in there. They're going for a free inhibitor. Then they might end up backing off. But again, Chow Mei going for that explosion. Him and Ezreal. Are they going to try to stop them from going back? There's the Reverie. Here it comes. Wicked has gone back, and you can see Wei Zhao straight on towards that turret. And Yellow P is going to have to go back and defend this one. COG trying their best. Actually, that true shot barrage nearly landed. Can they get on towards the turret? They're actually doing damage on towards the turret. Wicked's going to get taken low. Wei Zhao on towards Wicked. Yellow P is back. He gets in time. Has he got enough to burn down Sao Mei? He's got the slowdown on him. He's got that red buff. One more shot to do it. No, he didn't pop the GA. He got away with it with Murder. I do not. CLG aren't safe in this position. This they is very get dangerous. Off. They're getting chased down. Krillov might be able to catch Snoopy here. He's caught out to him and he's going to get the rupture in the silence. Is it enough? He manages to get the feast down on him. And that's going to be Snoopy in all sorts of trouble. Yellow P's desperate trying to run it. Wei Zhao turns on towards Wicked. Wicked has to use the flash. He's trying to lead them away from Yellow P. They realize he has to defend him. But he's on CLG EU as well. There's going to be a big fight coming up very shortly. You can hear the screams from the players going through. They're going for this final inhibitor. Yep. Snoopy coming in there, but the shockwave down to the bottom was very strong. Crescendo comes around as well. Cleal of starting to fall low. Will the Elite trying to come away? Messiah under pressure. His GA is going to get popped, as is the one of Frogan. Greco was in there. Chow Mei has managed to take down Yellow Peach GA, but there are seven on the map right now. That's a lot of dying and coming back to life. Here we go. Chow Mei in towards Snoopy. Down to half HP. Flashes in. Yellow Peach is dead. Snoopy now the one under pressure. He will go down. Wicked is the last man left alive. His guardian angel gets popped, and this is it, Demon. Yeah, they're going to take it through. That's the kill. You can see them. Team WE after such a hard-fought match. 69-minute game, ladies and gentlemen. Give both teams a round of applause, because that was a fantastic game. CLG versus Team WE. And wow, what a game, Jat. How the hell do you follow that one-hour, nine-minute game? 200k gold plus across both teams, absolute insanity. To date, this is still considered by some to be the most entertaining and close, exciting match in League of Legends history. There's a VOD of it up on IGN's main YouTube channel right now with nearly 4 million views, simply titled, The Best LOL Match Ever Played. This victory sent WE into the winner's finals where they would now have to face off against Fnatic from groups in another close EU versus China series. In game one, Fnatic started off taking a victory 
victory with their impressive youngster dragging his team to a win with some insane Ezreal play, which WE then responded by reverse sweeping them the next two games as Messiah carried his team with a pretty insane Evelyn mid. As we mentioned before, this sent Fnatic to the Losers Finals where they managed to beat TPA to get a rematch in Grand Finals and once again had a great performance from all of their team in Game 1 going down then they realize they can't really fight this one but they're gonna lose another inhibitor if they don't engage and that's gonna mean two it is so as it goes in he kicks out Wei Zhao Wei Zhao Valkyrie's out they can see the curse of the side bombing down Wei Zhao yet to go down PK manages coming PK picks up two on towards clear though the charm comes up PK gets in there in cyanide that picks up the kill triple kill for PK as well and Saramay the last man standing Fnatic diving in towards the Nexus turrets. This is going to be game. This is going to level things off. It's going to be 1-1, all square. We have four matches left. Who will take the championship at IPL 5? But in games two and three, WE really let their talent shine and were able to pick up the victory, winning IPL 5, their biggest international victory the organization would maybe ever see. But it wasn't really enough. They do take down Messiah, but everybody else is in trouble. Salmay completely tanking, reckless down, and Raiden in trouble. They're all caught out by the tower. Pique having to use his ultimate to try and avoid the damage. It's a triple kill for Wei Zhao, though. He is stomping through the Pique goes down. It's a ultimate ace there and Team WE just turning on the pressure, turning on towards the Nexus turrets. They are going to tank this one up, Jack. Much like the tournament, they just crushed the final game. It's only fitting. They lost a few for Fnatic, but that was brilliant execution for Team WE. Let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Team World Elite, the winners of the IGF Pro League 5 here in Las Vegas. Fantastic performance. As disappointing as it was for Western fans to see Fnatic fall, in retrospect, this was a hugely important victory for Team WE. Even though they'd go on to be one of the most legendary organizations in league history, they would never really win another major international event, even to this day. After IPL 5, WE began to fall into a bit of a tailspin. The Chinese League, the LPL, was starting up soon, and although they were one of the hottest and best teams going into Season 3, WE would never win a single LPL split with this original roster, it wouldn't be until 2017, nearly five years later, that they'd snag a championship in the Chinese League, at which point all these legendary players were long gone. This is what was so neat about some of these independent tournaments in the early years of League. Even if a talented roster disappointed at one event, there would always be another tournament a few months away they could find redemption at, and of all those redemption stories through throughout seasons one and two, I don't think any one of them had to be greater than this one for World Elite. To go from being the butt end of a joke, getting stranded on stage for eight hours only to get eliminated from season two worlds after completing just three games, to go from that to winning a major international championship, I mean, that had to have felt pretty sweet for them. Thank goodness that IPL 5 happened, because without it, this great roster might have never gotten the recognition they truly, truly deserved. I really cannot overemphasize how little I've touched on when it comes to the storylines and experiences we got to see at IPL 5. It was really a special event for so many reasons, but let me try and maybe put it in better perspective with the following example. One of the coolest teams from seasons one and two was a squad called the Singapore Sentinels who competed in the region of Southeast Asia. What made them so interesting was in spite of the fact that this roster was made up entirely of players from Singapore, Singapore, a tiny city-state nation with only about five and a half million people, somehow they turned into one of the best League of Legends teams this region would ever see. In the inaugural Garena Premier League, the Sentinels were one of only two teams to get wins against the eventual world champion Taipei Assassins. TPA won that league, but beyond that, Singapore dominated every other competitive team who represented nations with far larger talent pools and populations than 
than them. Part of the reason this squad was so good was their fantastic mid laner Chawi and their multi-role talent Darkness, who had been playing League of Legends together since the 2010 World Cyber Games, the very first tournament League ever had. Chawi in particular is one of my personal favorite players of all time. He was not only one of the best players from League's early history, playing professionally for nearly nine years, now working as a coach, but he's also one of the best multi-game talents in esports history as he competed at the very first Dota 2 International, making it to a top three finish with another all Singaporean team. The reason I bring this team up is the Singapore Sentinels were one of the many teams who barely missed out on going to season two worlds. They were upset in the Southeast Asian qualifiers by a Vietnamese squad they had previously sent to losers bracket, but with a loss in the grand finals, it seemed as though they might have missed out on their one and only shot of playing on the world stage at least if it wasn't for IPL5. SGS was able to win their IPL5 qualifier and had a second chance to showcase their talents in front of the whole globe, which they took full advantage of. In their group stage, they'd pull out a win against Poe Belter's team Meat before sadly choking in that tiebreaker game against TSM. But of course, because of the tournament structure, they would get to play more games. In their losers bracket match, they were seated against an all Hong Kong squad from the LMS named Team Team Iceland. Iceland was one of the worst performers in group stage, but still had a very talented roster that didn't drop a single game in their own qualifiers to make it to this event. This best of three they played against each other was a really fun thing for fans to see. Chawi got to play on the international stage, crushing with an impressive Katarina mid game one. Darkness put on his own impressive jungle performance, getting a combined KDA of 2, 3, and 27 on his support supportive Jarvan jungle, not to mention this series could be seen as a fun little city-state war between rival league regions of Singapore and Hong Kong. When the series was all said and done, the Singapore Sentinels would come out victorious with a 2-0 sweep advancing in bracket to face TPA, who would eliminate them with their own 2-0 sweep and finally ended their tournament run. But honestly, this short little run SGS had with their legendary roster and the strategies they used and their results against each region and the importance it had in their squad's history. I mean, I could make a three hour video just talking about all of their experiences at this event alone. That's how rich their IPL5 story is, how important these matches were, and just how much there was to follow. And look at what a small note they played in this gigantic symphony. IPL5 wasn't perfect. Like all tournaments, its structure had its flaws. WE only had to beat three European teams to be crowned champions. Only playing best of threes meant potential comeback victories ended early in 2-1 or 2-0 sets. And on top of that, some of the teams here were still eliminated fairly quickly, only playing four games in total before being sent home, which wasn't that much better than the two to three game minimum at season two worlds. But IPL still gave gave us such a great event in its final tournament. I mean, it didn't just give us more games or more inter-regional play, but it gave us more chances for these teams to add to their legacies and prove their talent. It gave us a better assessment of who was really good and who was about to crush the competitive scene, but most importantly of all, it gave us stories that we otherwise would never have gotten a chance to see. There may not ever be another international league event with this exact structure, or with these kinds of upsets, this exciting bracket, or this many narratives to follow, but whatever the future holds for League, we will always have its past, and IPL5 will always go down in history as one of the best tournaments League of Legends ever had. Thank you so much for watching this documentary. I hope you enjoyed it. Shout out to my patrons for making videos like these possible. If you'd like to make a contribution to the channel and support me in making more documentary videos like this, please feel free to do so with the links on screen or in the description down below.